Good evening YouTube. Some of the videos I've done in the past that I am least proud of are ones where I've basically lost my temper with someone with whom I very strongly disagree uh, and have gone after them a bit. Anyway, they're, they're cathartic but I don't think they stand up that well and I think they just look petty as a result. So I'm making an effort this time not to do that and uh, to tackle the, pla the uh, ball and not the player because there's a video I want to respond to from someone with whom I do disagree very much the video in question is one from Martin J. Willett it's called The Blackwashing of History um, there's also the script for it up on his website, right to think link in the description I want to do three things, basically. Firstly, look at the overall argument. Secondly, some of the specific errors he makes. And thirdly, I want to look at what it says about Martin's overall way of making an argument. So, firstly, the argument which the argument Martin Way, J. Willett makes, as I understand it, is that the government and the media are faking British history to give non-whites a more prominent role in history and that there's a lot of this. It's worth considering what you need to do to make that argument, to make the argument stand up. Firstly, I think you'd need some data or comparisons of media portrayals of different ethnic groups at different times. You know, you're, he's talking about what's being put out there in the media. Secondly, what, you know, to know whether that makes a difference, you need data on people's perceptions of different ethnic groups at different times and on what they think happened in history. Thirdly, you need some sort of mechanism to show how the former would cause the latter. Fourthly, you need some way of controlling the many, many variables at work that could also account for what's going on. Now that's a thumbnail sketch if you've got particularly small thumbnails and Martin if you're watching this I don't think you've made any effort to do that at all. There are some side points along the way. One is that people are buying into this. Again, how do you know? Um, something about England isn't unique. Well no, England isn't unique. You know, it's not that different from many other countries, but perhaps the, you know, in the, its economy isn't that different from one country, its language from another, its religion from another, its history and so on. But perhaps the particular constellation do make it, if not unique, different from others. Another thing that comes up that I saw is that Martin doesn't understand, or is very careless with, the difference between word, the words black, Muslim and immigrant. Uh, a time using the former as a as a you know coverall for the others now sometimes it's used like that you know words are often disputable um, I think it, it makes it harder to see what's going on and just gives the appearance of a dislike of anybody who can't trace themselves back to ten sixty six through what I think is unfortunate use of words there's also Martin suggests that nobody likes immigration. Um, I, I couldn't find the reference again, but it's something like two-thirds, one-thirds thing that immigration generally has been positive for the UK. Um, I, I can't remember it exactly, but there's also something along the lines of no, very few people think it's wholly good or wholly bad. Martin suggests he isn't a racist. Well, I'll leave that to your own opinions. And that we are acquiescing in our own genocide, which I find to be the most contemptible nonsense. There, there are still tens of millions of English people going around. Um, you know, the population is still growing, uh, including of, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, indigenes, um, whites in, in England and Wales and Scotland and wherever. Um, yeah, the fact that things are changing around us does not constitute genocide in any way. Um, talking about history um, in, in a way that you don't find um, appealing isn't genocide. It's people trying to look at things in a different way, perhaps. 
but this I mean com comparing what you believe to be uh, and again, I get said again without any suggestion of any evidence for it to be a change in the way things are uh, reported in the media to the Holocaust or the Holodomor or the Armenian Genocide frankly it, it's hyperbole um, so anyway one of the things both listening to it and reading the script on his website that I found with a number of just gigantic errors mistakes that I just didn't think could be allowed to slide so I'm just going to pick up some of them that's the second point um, one, and this is quoting, quote, if you would believe the mainstream culture in Britain, the messages promoted by the media and endorsed by laws and, and government strategy, the principal British virtue is and always has been tolerance of ethnic diversity. And I have to ask, on what do you base that? Um, I mean, certainly, you know, from you know history a long time ago, I remember learning about the expulsion of the Jews. I think it was Edward Longshanks, Edward the first. Um, you know, we're, the, we've had all sorts of conflict in this country perhaps not as much as as other places but historically there has been and okay it's a long time ago since i was in school but you know i think that was <laughs> that was being taught but beyond that on what do you base that in any case i submit that there is at least a section of the media that, that doesn't do this i just had a quick gander at the front pages of the express for this month but to come up with something a little better perhaps from the Migration Policy Institute. Quote, Since 1999, concern about immigration in Britain, the link will be in the description, has reached levels never seen before in the history of public opinion research, and surveys show strong support for tougher immigration laws. Higher immigration has corresponded with increased concern, and media coverage of asylum in particular has caused people to report immigration as a national problem, even if not in that area. But opinions vary. Younger, better educated people and those who tend to live in areas with a longer history of immigration are more tolerant than older, less educated people in more settled communities with low levels of immigration. In general, the British support multiculturalism but want newcomers to learn English and earn citizenship and are concerned about the rate of change in some communities. Thus far, the economic downturn has not caused concern about immigration to increase. Um, so a few things that I mean potentially you could find support even for your own position there Martin if you if you if you'd gone and look for it but I think that's what you know what that's suggesting is it's a complicated picture not this black and white thing that you're putting out to continue from the from the same report quote many individuals have only encountered the rising volume of immigration through the media at least before the recent wave of migration from the Eastern European countries that joined the European Union in 2004. Ipsos Mori's analysis, analysis suggests that individual peaks and troughs in concern do seem related to print newspaper coverage and of course TV and radio news, not included in this analysis, see figure three. For many regions in the United Kingdom, the most visible sign of increased immigration prior to 2004 was the heavy media coverage of asylum migration. This was particularly heavy in tabloids like the Daily Mail and Daily Express, which have regularly run front page news stories about quote shocking and quote asylum and immigration figures end quote overall. So I mean you can look at that, maybe you can criticize what it you know what it says, the methodology, whatever, but I think your basic idea that the media are promoting this this idea is wrong. I think people are talking uh, about immigration, saying that they don't like immigration, saying that things aren't the way they used to be. Now, I know that you you said in in your piece that you were talking um, more about um, cult, you know, culture or ethnicity rather than immigration. But I think it's fair to say, given the way you look at things, that you you would accept one as a proxy for the other. Now, it may be that Martin J. Willett is re referring to the criticism of the BNP and so on that you see in the tabloid. I remember the Sun's bloody nasty people headline. I think it was the Sun. But, and again, nothing to suggest there's any actual thought here, that's not the same as saying we've always had ethnic tolerance. I would like to know how Martin feels about the Edict of Expulsion of 1290. 
202 years before Spain, 1492, and the fact that it was overturned under Cromwell relatively early, but still 350 years later in 1656, um, you know, early compared to other countries. I think I'm right in that. There's a discussion to be had about that, just for, you know, just for its own sake as much as anything else, about um, immigration and acceptance of ethnic people, of ethnic um, groups other than those who are already here at any particular time, you know, over history in English and British history. Sure, absolutely. Why we have to be bound by that one way or another, I don't know. The hist history isn't necessarily a guide to the present. Moving on. The British media is full of faked blackwashed history, Martin says. Based on what? Quote, there were no non-white characters in the legend of Robin Hood before the 1990s, end quote. Robin of Sherwood ran on ITV in the UK from 1984 to 1986 and featured Mark Ryan as Nasir, a Saracen assassin. Now, not unreasonably, you could say, but this is only a few years earlier. The point I'm making is, well... This was the first Google result that came up, a Wikipedia link, for Saracen Robin Hood. Now, Martin mentions Saracens about Robin Hood, and I, ju I just can't see any way he could have even done a simple Google search to, to, to verify this. Yeah, I see that as really problematic. Again, Martin, if you're watching this... Okay, yeah, it's only a few years, but I hope you get where I'm coming from, that to show that you made a mistake, you know, just this one minor one takes 10 seconds on Google and Wiki, and you know, there's a whole string of others, and I do wonder if you haven't just done even that for something very easy to, to find, um, whether the West, the rest, <laughs> Freudian slip. It's interesting that in the video Martin chooses what appears to me, and I may be wrong, to be a picture of a children's play of Robin Hood with uh, a mixture of ethnicities in it to illustrate the point. I'm not sure that the best way of achieving integration or harmony or whatever through teaching the history of the island is to say, well children, we're going to do Robin Hood this term, but you can't be in the play because you're black. I don't think that's going to fly, particularly as the, ch the child could say, but in the film Robin Hood was played by a fox. In any case, and I just bring this up just so I briefly look through some of the older Robin Hoods, um, you know, legends, the, the legends of Robin Hood have changed over time anyway. Now, one of the other things that Martin said was, quote, the black population of Britain before the 1950s was never more than a few thousand. End quote. The first mention I could quickly find of uh, black people being born in Britain was 1573 in the parish records of St. Olav Hart Street. Um, and a quote, unfortunately I'm reading down the <laughs> reference here where I'm reading from, which is unfortunate, I'll put it in the description. Quote, blacks remained in England throughout the Renaissance and by the middle of the 18th century comprised somewhere between 1 and 3% of the London populace. End quote. Old Bailey Online suggests a figure in excess of 3 million Londoners. So somewhere between 30 and 90,000 black people just in London um, in the 18th century. The Hindu, January the 5th, 2003, suggests that at a similar time there were 70,000 South Asians in Britain. So I have to ask, what is your source for the number of blacks in Britain before the 1950s. Another quote from Martin. The effect is to distract attention from the simple fact that Britain has never been anything like the black or brown as it is today. End quote. Based on what? And, you know, even if we grant that, you know, the, the change, and obviously there is change happening, what does that mean? I think just saying, oh, I want it to be the way it was, isn't particularly helpful. It, it, you know, just saying, I have this vision of history of how the country should be and I want it to, to, to be like this, even when you, you don't seem to have any basis for this vision of history is really problematic, not least because the world has changed around us 
I don't know. Maybe the economic situation now, the end of the Cold War, an ageing population changes things. Maybe it doesn't, but they at least bear considering. We then have this diversion into talking about America. Um, it's worth mentioning that the, the um, in terms of the ethnic makeup of the UK, blacks are a relatively small amount, particularly compared to people from South Asia. I'll leave links to the censuses 2001-2011 in the description. But you start talking about blacks in America, where blacks there, my point is, are demographically more significant. And, you know, who complains about, you know, I think, I think effectively Black History Month and says that various people are um, coming up with with black inventors who have come up with what Martin considers to be minor patents and saying this this you know makes them great. I don't know, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Could you not even have found one rather than coming up with a throwaway name uh, to to mention? Moving on. I mean and oh yeah and in this as well there's something about white people having a history of which they should be ashamed. Well, no, I, I don't think that's the way things are in the country at the moment. Um, I mean, if nothing else, there was that programme, um, The Greatest Britons, or 100 Greatest Britons, which was celebrating British, you know, British culture. Most of the people on there happened to be white. And as I recall, it was very popular at the time. Um, just history around us generally is you know, just because of the makeup of the UK is largely talking about white people. Well, the makeup of the UK and you know relations in the UK and you know you get the picture. So I just don't buy into that. I don't think people are running around saying you should be ashamed because of what someone in Bristol did in the slave trade. I think we should say yes, this happened. This is something that bears research. We should know where we came from. Blah blah blah. But I don't think I see anyone saying that any more than you personally should be proud of. Um, I don't know, empire, or Britain's role in, oh, you know, the conquest of the Americas, if it had one, you know, whatever it happens to be. I don't see that. Moves on, saying, quote, Teaching our nation's children that white people have history to be ashamed of is playing into the hands of Muslim supremacists, that is, Muslims. There are no Muslims who do not see Islam as superior and Muslims de deserving of superior treatment, end quote. Okay, so what he, Martin is saying there is that all Muslims are Muslim supremacists. So to prove Martin wrong on that point, I need to find one Muslim who isn't. Ali Sufan, look him up, and then asks whether, ask yourself whether this former FBI agent fits your description. There's a link in the, uh, in the description here to an article he wrote in Forbes where he says, inter alia, quote, When demagogues appear to be equating Islam with terrorism, it's making young Muslims unsure about their place in the country. It bolsters the message that radicalizes are selling, that the war is against Islam and Muslims are not welcome in America. As a Muslim American, I know that isn't true. Whatever some rabble-rousing politicians say about one mosque doesn't trump what America really stands for, the values enshrined by our constitution that guarantee equality and freedom for all, whatever your race, religion or creed. I find it almost mind-blowing that Martin can seriously say that a billion people who fall under the catch-all term Muslim all agree, all agree with what he thinks Islam is and means and act on that basis. He seems to have, I mean, even if we take this idea that there is this thing called Islam, that's the right way of doing it. The idea that everyone agrees with it, believes in it equally, that there aren't any people who are just sort of culturally Muslim and yeah, don't really care, it is, well, frankly, it's ridiculous. But beyond that, um, just look at the difference between Sunnis and Shias. There are differences there between somebody in... Uh, I don't know, Birmingham, someone in Baghdad. I, I just find it... Okay, I ask if there's any other group which you would lump into, a, you know, which you could give a term to, that you would say act in that way, with a, with a single focus, with, with, a, with a single aim. It, it, it just strikes me as, as well, as I said, ridiculous. I mean, communism, would you have really said that everybody in a communist country, so I, I don't know how many there were exactly, but say a billion, say 500 million, all acted towards the same goal? 
it, it's laughable it really is laughable now going on quoting from Martin again it is time we got some balance back. We need to teach our children about the horrors of the Arab slave trade in Africa, the history of Swahili, a language used to facilitate the exploitation of Africans as a commodity, end quote, used for other things as well, you know, same as with English. Yes, it was the language of the slave trade, but also Shakespeare, Mutatis Mutandis. Martin, I think, clearly is, is, is coming through, I think is rather biased on this. But the slave trade from, um, you know, through the UK, or organized by the UK, should be put in its historical context and be compared to other instances. I have no problem with that. I have a problem with what Martin is suggesting, or what I think he's suggesting, which is to say it wasn't as bad as what the Muslims were doing. I think go, you know, going out with, with what I think Martin would be doing, a preconception, would be problematic. But, you know, quite apart from anything else, again, I don't think we have the records. But, um, you know, I have no problem with that. The point of all those errors is really to show one thing. No, no research, no evidence, no thought, no argument, no chance. What really, to move on to the third and final part, annoyed me about Martin's video was when he said this, quoting again, I'll admit that several years formal education in social science had a big impact on me end quote, and then he talks about how he had to shrug off this effectively liberal indoctrination. That really annoyed me. I have a bachelor's and a master's in social sciences, one way or another. Admittedly, I'm pretty much at the bottom of the pile, but I think I get to call myself a social scientist, or at least say I have some idea, vaguely, of what I'm talking about. One of the things that was impressed upon me, particularly in the master's, is that evidence matters and methodology matters. When you're trying to make some claim about the way the world is, or was, or how we got where we are, or what would happen if you did something, the evidence matters, the methodology matters. We all approach issues with our own biases, no doubt about it. One of the ways we can try to stop those biases affecting what we're trying to say, when we're trying to say something about the way the world is rather than the way the world should be it is by having you know, is by looking at three things as honestly and as clearly as possible looking going back as far as we can to you know good research that's you know recognized such from elsewhere to the original evidence where possible you get the idea by having you know as I said that spiel at the start some idea of what we would have to do to try and show what we're trying to show and the result quite often is, um, well, all the time, is difficult to know things. And sometimes there's something that we feel, we think is right, we think this is the way the world is or was, but we can't actually show it. And just your, your gut feeling or your want, it, want, your desire for it to be true, doesn't trump that. I have to say, Martin, if you spent several years as you say, formal education in social sciences, and this nonsense is what you produce, I think you did yourself a disservice in emerging from under it. To suggest that everyone involved in social sciences is some raving liberal, I think is, or left wing is ridiculous. My, the institution to which, you know, where I've studied is the LSE. Okay, it has a reputation as being a hotbed of liberalism. It's also the home of some fairly impressive conservative thinkers over the years. I'm not putting him in the in the league of Karl Popper, say, but if you look at Nick Barr at the moment, LSE economist, he's the guy who came up who did a lot of the work on top-up fees, for instance. Now, I understand, Martin, that you don't like some of what you see in your country around you. That doesn't mean you get to cherry-pick data or make assertions about whole groups of people without even trying to justify them or even not have any data or evidence at all. Just a few things at the end. According to the 2011 census, 86% of the population of England and Wales were of white ethnicity. Ten years earlier, 2001, it was 91.3%. 3.7 million increase in population in that time, of which 2.1 million were immigrants. The foreign-born population in the UK rose from 8.9 to 13.4%. The country changed. 
and that's before we talk about economics or religion or age or anything else. Yes, our country is changing and we need to talk about this individually as a country, as a people and to work out what it means and how we deal with it and what we want to do about it. And of course, we are not going to come to one consensus answer. Well, we can't, though, have that debate that we need when people prevent us from having an informed debate. And I'm afraid that one of the things that does that is people like Martin J. Willett who present their own opinions as reality. I'm Landon Cole. I'll see you next time.